Um, a good afternoon to everyone. My name is Brenda Gonzalez Hermosillo, and um, I'm going to be introducing this session. I say that uh, I, um, I, I work, I co author several papers with uh, Mar Marty as, as well with uh, Vance and Renee. Uh, in fact, I was kind of putting this together, and I think we go like eight or ten years of working together. We had a wonderful long distance relationship because they were in Australia <coughs> and while they were sleeping, I was working. And while I was working, they were. And while I was sleeping, they were working, so it just worked fabulously. In fact, we the work we did, I think at the time, you know, this goes back to the early 2000s uh, when we started working together. Um, uh, we were, I believe, some of the first people, although I, I shouldn't say that uh, since uh, uh, Graciela is here and she's probably going to correct me know this, but we were some of the, the first people working on cross market and cross-country uh, analysis of financial crisis, and particularly looking at systemic <coughs> crisis. So um, I know Graciela has done a lot of work, and much more than I have. Um, but we were looking at high-frequency data, and it was really exciting, because it had to do a lot of, you know, now I'm meeting some of the people who I know from, uh, in person from the people that we knew we were taking some of the, their analysis. So, um, we had basically, you know, we presented our work over that uh, pretty much decade all over the uh, many places, and we had great fun. Um, so I was trying to think about Marty and some of the best trips we had. Maybe it was the one in Rome that the four, the four of us, or the three of us, were together. Um, the four of us were together. Um, that I think uh, Renee was telling me she was showing a picture. I didn't see it. Uh, before, but you know, we were in Venice, and it's curious to present the, our seminars and to then have a great time. Now, one of the things, I don't remember having any disagreements uh, between, uh, between us, maybe because it really was like that. I mean, we were very productive, we were in contact, uh, and there was not a lot of room to disagree. We were all seemed to be in the same, in the same side of things, and we, you know, uh, worked really well together in uh, dividing some of the uh, our knowledge and what we brought to the table. So perhaps one of the only things I remember, and I try to remember how how the decision got made, and maybe uh, Vance and Renee can help me here, but was our masterpiece. And this was um, we published a book, and what I couldn't remember as I look at it is why on earth did we put that painting in there? And <laughs> what painting was that? And I'm trying to, I believe it was Marty's doing. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, University of Oxford that apparently needed a piece of art. And so, you know, I mean, like, none of us care. I mean, we were kind of, a, you know, uh, doing coding and uh, computers were breaking and all kinds of things were happening. So whatever. I think we, we said to Marty, just put whatever, and she picked this, this painting, <laughs> which don't ask me in questions what it was, because I don't remember. So, you know, nine years ago, it got published in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2011. So nine years later, I had no idea that I would not remember this piece of information. And I was wondering, as I was doing this, um, and I'm trying to put this together, why didn't we just pick something that we all will recognize? <laughs> or even one of these pictures that, uh, all of you have shown about, you know, Marty hiking or doing things uh, fun. Uh, I, I I don't know why we, we didn't do it. Uh, or go for the go for the really the bottom line. What we were working on? We were working on contagion, chaos, uh, black swans, and uh, 
we probably we probably thought the book would not sell with that there, but it was kind of happened at the same time. So um, as as I put this together, just a brief introduction. I wanted to uh, well thank Marty um, wherever she is, and of course my Australian friends, the dear Australian friends, um, uh, 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 Vance and, and Renee in particular, and kind of try to. Um, sort of uh, have a reincarnation to all the work that we did, all the long hours. Uh, one of the things we did, of course, is that we work in black sweats. We really uh, devoted a decade of our lives to try to figure out systemic financial crisis and you know, how, do we, how do we know about it, how, how this was happening, uh, what were the precursors, what was, uh, you know, from the data from different countries, from you know, uh, decades uh, of, of analysis. Um, and, you know, in, in my field, where I, I've been working in financial crisis for, I don't know, three decades or longer, um, you know, it's one of those uh, kind of very seasonal jobs, <laughs> kind of to follow the previous uh, presentation. You are in high demand when there's a financial crisis and then everybody forgets about you after that one is mopped up until the next decade when there's another one. And so uh, we haven't had a financial crisis since I was, at, uh, I was a deputy division chief in global financial stability at the fund. And I had fun to work for since 2007 on the global financial crisis. So, um, you know, so now it's, it's sort of a little bit of the past, but I'm finding some interesting applications that I, I would like to invite all this, this great minds here and, and my colleagues. Um, to start thinking about some of the methodologies that we have collectively developed or stole from each other, <laughs> with, with the, you know, kind of learn from each other and add one grain of salt is the green um, uh, swine. Green swines are so unique that nobody has seen them. And now what, I mean, you, you probably have seen a little bit of this reference, the BIS had a paper, just came out last month, about a black swine you know, unusual extreme events, so unusual that in financial crisis, we see them maybe once a decade. Uh, and this one might be once every thousand years or more, which is related to climate change. But not just climate change per se, but the implications for, uh, for example, market risk, credit risk, uh, you know, how does this event that uh, none of us have seen, that that's why I pick up this picture of a green swan, because it just doesn't, make, we, we haven't seen it. So somebody had to put it together, but how do we start using our information and knowledge to really address one of the, the biggest challenges of the planet? And I won't talk about it because, um, you know, I have some ideas of started thinking about it, but I, I want to invite this, this uh, great audience to, you know, with expertise that we have and, and in memory of, of Marty as well, to uh, take this challenge ahead. And, and I'd love to talk to you guys more uh, about this later on. But now the, the spotlight goes to to Graciela. And I, well, Graciela needs, of course, no introduction. Everybody knows her. Uh, in fact, I even, I was surprised to find her. She is in Wikipedia. Um, and this is terrific. I mean, she has, well, her publications are five pages, so I won't go through them. Everybody knows about them. Of course, she is an expert that uh, has worked on contagion, financial crisis exchange rates, you know, coin the, the twin crisis with, with um, um, Carmen Reichert, um, fiscal monetary policies, international capital flows, and sovereign debt crisis. And she will talk to us um, in a minute about uh, debt crisis, debt uh, 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 flows. Um, um, I met Graciela, or well, I knew about her, I, I knew about her before I met her, about 20 years ago. Uh, I was publishing when, when your paper in the American Economic Review with, with um, Carmen Reichen came, which was completely smashing success, uh, the twin crisis uh, in 1999. I was also working in uh, financial crisis, but I, had, I took the long road of working with balance sheets of banks. I don't know, and I was working with different countries, so it was very uh, intensive in accounting and very messy uh, and very, it was, it was awful. And, and then I was very surprised, um, I was really excited too, I mean, that the work that, that uh, you've done, 
became really a sensational smash in history. I mean, it's in every textbook. You've done a terrific work, uh, came up with a great little formula, uh, little noise-to-signal ratios that uh, only took banks at zero and ones. And here I was going through all the, the non-performing loans and all this, uh, and it was the beauty of your simplicity of the work that you did that became really a standard, and everybody who works in early warning indicators uh, uses your, your information and your, your analysis. So um, I just, uh, she continues to do very uh, thought-provoking work, and of course she's, not, she's known to all of you, so with that I give you Graciela, thank, thank you. you. I've been listening to all of you since early this morning, and I'm not talking about much. Okay. It's also about microphone, is it? Is it on? If not, the microphone works. Ah, okay. So I've been saying that uh, I've been listening attentively to all of you, and I have just one sentence to say and it's how much I envy you. Um, you have been co-authors of Marvin. Some of you, like Brenda, that she has co-authored eight papers. But you all share, whether it was eight papers, one paper, you all share the creativity, the enthusiasm, and the creation that Marvin had doing research in so many different areas, uh, from financial crisis, uh, contagion with Brenda, looking at macro structure and forecasting of the economy, doing network analysis. Every time that I met Marty, she was doing something else. Uh, so unfortunately, I did not share that with her. But fortunately, I did share her friendship. She invited me once to go to Cambridge University, and I spent a summer with her. And I became a friend. I share, we started sharing our interests in life, and both of us and like to go climbing and, uh, and uh, hiking and camping and uh, being always uh, very dirty with, uh, with dirt. <laughs> and uh, we started with that, and then we started sharing economics and uh, sharing families. And uh, I really enjoy her ingenuity, her creativity, and the friendship. Uh, I shared when I was in uh, Cambridge, uh, going to visit the family and sitting on the floor and messing with the kids and the, and the toys and everything. And uh, it was super. Not, you have, you, I know very good economists. I, I count with the, days, with the fingers in my hand the number of people that is so daring, uh, so uh, interesting, and a good friend. And um, we have seen, we kept on seeing each other. Unfortunately, we never worked together. We had an idea of working on uh, liquidity in financial markets, but because we were with other projects, we never did. But I kept on met, meeting with her. I went to Tasmania. Uh, I was one of the good the people that I was invited to Tasmania. And she came several times to GW. And we shared um, research. We shared gossip. Uh, and we shared dinners. Uh, so I will never uh, forget her. I was really very sad when I learned suddenly of her death. But now I'm remembering, like all of you, the fun times. And this is how I'm going to remember Mardi for a long, long time. So, um, and I love that picture. This is Mardi. <laughs> OK, I would like to say that Mardi incentivated this research that I'm going to present now. I started, when I went to Cambridge, I started to get interested in historical data. So I started traveling to London to learn how the data, and it took many years to collect the data set. But now I would like to present to you, okay, this uh, research that started long ago and used dozens and dozens of research assistants uh, to complete. Okay. 
So let me see. No? Which one do I have to touch? Oh, here. The right one. Yeah, I touched the right one. Mm. I'm starting with that one. Mm. Oh, this appeared in my uh, presentation. Oh. <laughs> Always start from the end. <laughs> okay, so you're going to hear about capital flows to the periphery. You are also going to hear about monetary policy in the financial center. And you're also going to hear in this paper about crisis in the financial center and how to affect the periphery. Uh, there are many papers that look at this, but this has an important twist. It has 200 years of data. So it gives us some advantages in learning a little bit more about the different causes of, uh, of booms and busts uh, in the periphery. So let me talk a little bit about what is the conventional wisdom. Uh, we always, when we talk about capital block bonanzas uh, to the periphery, most of us conclude that they are excessive and lead to sudden stops. Um, and in general, there are many culprits okay, to these booms and busts, these excessive bonanzas and sudden stops. Uh, but the most frequently uh, mentioned are the cycles in monetary easing and uh, tightening in the financial center, in this case, the United States. With the crisis in 2007 and 2009, uh, economists started to examine okay, what is the role of a panic in the financial center on the rest of the periphery. Okay? And they pay attention to excessive international borrowing predating the crisis and the global retrenchment in the aftermath. Um, the problem with most of the analysis of, uh, of cycles uh, focus on the mostly in the 1990s and the 2000s. And when we look at the conclusions about the role of panics in the financial center, most of the time we just um, focus on the crisis of the panic in 2007-2009. Okay? Um, so there is a problem okay, with this uh, data that we don't have a lot of information on capital flow bonanzas. In general, if we look at all the second episode of financial globalization, we are going to look to see at the most three cycles in booms and busts to the periphery. And there is a problem of identifying what is the role of monetary policy. Uh, what are the shocks? Um, in general, it's easy to identify shocks to monetary policy when you look at very high frequency events. But when you look at capital flow bonanzas, they are long lasting. And there are many other factors that affect these capital flow bonanzas, such as oil shocks, commodity shocks, uh, the starting of the European Monetary Union, savings glut, etc. Okay? We also have one panic. Uh, most of the, the research on capital flows to the periphery it focuses on the crisis of 2008. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use okay, the data that I constructed starting in 1920. And I'm, this data set is going to have two major advantages. First of all, or second of all, uh, there are uh, Panics in the financial center are rare disasters, black swans, so you need to have a long uh, period of time to examine. And so this is what I'm going to have with all the data that I collected starting in 1820. The second advantage, or the first advantage here in the, in the presentation, is that there is a big difference okay, on what the central banks do right now and what they did before. And in the earlier period, the financial centers, and in particular uh, London, uh, was, uh, and, and the, the UK was under the gold standard, and this limits the possibilities of doing 
okay, counter-cyclical monetary policy or an active role of central banks. Okay? So this is going to help me to identify the role of monetary policy on capital flows to the periphery. Okay. Um, I know that that is going to be with the uh, yellow card and then the red card, and it's going to stop me. So let me at least tell you what are my findings, okay? In this paper, I'm just focusing on Latin capital flows to Latin America. But you need to know that Latin American countries are the quintessential emerging markets. So this, and they started to borrow very early on. Okay? They got independence from Spain and Portugal. They eliminated all the trade restrictions and then they started to borrow in international capital markets. So we have a very long series of capital flows. Okay? Um, so um, I'm going to be examining the two episodes um, starting in 1820 to the Great Depression in 1931. At that time, okay, capital controls were erected around the world and they only were eliminated following the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. And so um, globalization restarted in the 1970s and so far we continue in an episode of financial globalization. What I'm going to do, I'm interested not only on in monetary policy of the financial center, I'm also interested in the role of of banks in the policy. So I'm going to identify varieties of capital flow cycle. To identify what I call systemic capital flow cycles, those around in the financial center. And I'm going to look separately whether they have different characteristics. And then I have all the idiosyncratic capital flow cycles that are all the other cycles that not, are not around a crisis in the so, what we find is that capital flow cycles, booms and busts, have changed over time. Okay? What I find is that idiosyncratic capital flow cycles have not changed. When you look at bonanzas back then, and you look at busts and sudden stops, and what was the total issuance in bonanzas and in busts, they haven't changed when you look at idiosyncratic uh, flow cycles, but they have changed when you look at those cycles that are around the panic in the financial center. And what I find is that at the core of these changes is the monetary regime in the financial center. Okay? Free from the gold standard, now the, the financial center can introduce cyclical monetary policy, counter-cyclical monetary policy, but what we obtain is that around Panics in the financial center, those cycles are much more drastic. So there are much higher hikes, okay, when you approach, okay, the peak uh, of the bonanza, and then suddenly you have much more easing, okay, after the panic in the financial center started. So this is going to moderate, okay, capital flow bonanzas to the periphery and is going to accentuate the issuance during the bus in the periphery. Okay? So we are going to see that the capital flow bonanzas okay, are smaller uh, around in the second episode of financial globalization, around a panic in the financial center, and then in the sudden stop, it's much less of a sudden stop, and uh, the periphery can borrow much more. What is interesting too, and that I haven't done research on this, is that uh, when you compare um, cycles uh, in the earlier period and the uh, systemic cycles uh, nowadays, what you find in the aftermath of the panics in the center, okay, it doesn't matter what type of monetary policy you did, but the activity is very similar back then to right now. Okay? And is another issue that I would like to explore more uh, in the future. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit of the database because it cost me a lot to collect this data, so you have to suffer through these two. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm going to identify these capital flow cycles and I'm going to look at the characteristics of bonanza and bus. I'm going to have a metric 
okay, to look at bonanza and bus. And then I'm going to be doing some analysis of what triggers these different sizes of capital flow bonanza and bus in different uh, in different varieties of capital uh, capital flow cycles and before and after. Okay. So let me just tell you very briefly what the data is all about. The database is granular. I collected each bond, each share that was issued in the financial markets, in the financial centers. I started with, uh, when I went to, I, I learned in Cambridge, I collected, I started to collect data from London, but the financial centers was not just not uh, London, but Paris, Hamburg, Frankfurt and Berlin and New York. And so I use information, none of the sources is complete, there is a lot of overlap, but I collected data from archives, from prospectuses, annual reports, you name it, okay? Uh, I constructed this data that I collected is gross primary issues, okay? It's how much foreigners buy bonds and shares of uh, the periphery. Uh, I collected the same database uh, for uh, the later period uh, from the archives of the World Bank and then from various di digital databases such as Dialogic, etc. Okay? This database is important. It doesn't include so only sovereign issues, but also private international issues. And if any country was at least one stop international capital markets, there it is. Okay? Um, so, so this is important to compare, okay, bonanzas and bus back then and bonanzas and bus right now. Okay, so just to give you an example, okay, I collected thousands and thousands of prospectuses. In the prospectuses you have information on how much it was issued. Just by coincidence, the prospectus that I'm showing is from Buenos Aires. Uh, so this is the province of Buenos Aires. It's a 6% uh, state loan in 1870. You have the information on how the loan is being redeemed. Okay, uh, back then uh, all the bonds were mostly callable. Okay, and you have information on how much was issued and the maturity uh, of uh, the bond. Okay, you have also information here from Paris, okay, another prospectus for railway in Brazil. Um, the, uh, the bonds were not issued only in London, and you have bonds that were issued in London, in Paris, in Frankfurt and Berlin, so here you have an, an example of what happened. So it's important to look at all the financial centers, especially for continental Europe. In continental Europe, most of the borrowing was from Paris and for Frank from Frankfurt and Berlin, okay? So in the case of Latin America, you have here more or less the percentage issue uh, in uh, London, in Paris, in Germany, and New York, okay, for all the countries, okay? So this is the importance of looking at all financial centers. Okay. Um, here you have some figures, okay? Um, then if you are interested, you can look at all the figures in the paper. It's in my website, okay? And you see booms and busts, okay? Several booms and busts. This is for all Latin American countries. And you have an idea how important was public versus uh, private borrowing. Is this data available? Hmm? Can we download it? Not uh, I'm putting into the web in my web page as I publish the paper. So uh, there is some data available in my uh, web page, but not this one. It hasn't been published yet. Okay. Um, so you have the same data for the later period. Okay. So here I'm just in uh, Argentina. This is the bar to bar cross population has to look at the size of the average. Okay? This is back then, this is right now. And you can see that Argentina, after the crisis in 2001, was out of financial markets and only started to restart it to borrow in 2016, that I don't have the, the, the data there. Okay? So here you have Brazil, you have Chile, etc. So how I do I identify uh, the cycles? Well, I use, of course, uh, Harding and Pagan 
uh, algorithm okay, to identify cycles. I'm not interested in identifying one-year cycles. I'm interested in identifying the larger booms and busts. Okay? So um, the restrictions that I impose that at least these cycles has a five-year okay, um, duration. Using this algorithm, I identified 34 cycles okay, for the Latin American countries for the first episode and 22 cycles for the second episode. Okay? In order to calculate okay, the amplitude of the boom and the amplitude of the bus, I cannot use gross issues, I need to obtain additions. Okay, and this is what I'm going to do. Okay, I'm calculating the amplitude of the bonanza, the sum at the accumulation of net issues from the trough to the peak divided by uh, exports at the time of the peak. And I do the same thing for issues during the bust. All the net issues from the peak to the trough, okay, uh, divided by exports at the time uh, of the trough. I don't use GDP because I didn't have GDP for those years. So for all the uh, cycles, I normalize by trend exports. Okay, um, it's problematic and it's a lot of work to estimate bonanza and bus. First of all, because we need to calculate net issues. And the bonds are callable during the first episode of financial globalization. So every time that interest rates in the financial center went down, everybody was restructured. So you need to, to, to find all the restructurings uh, of, uh, of the debt. Way, um, also, you have to take care because these countries defaulted. So every time that they default, then they have to restructure the debt. So you need to eliminate one bond, put the other bond, etc. So it's a lot of work. For the modern episode, you have also two, two, uh, two crises. We have the 1982 crisis of syndicated loans. And then for the case of uh, the bond defaults, uh, we have to look at Argentina 2001 and Uruguay uh, 2003. So here you can see that the, you can find, for the earlier episode, you can find in many places, conversions and redemptions. So here you can see that in the, um, the, in the 1876, um, there was a wave of restructurings uh, in, uh, in foreign bonds. Okay, so uh, let me talk a little bit about whether international uh, borrowing cycles have changed. So here you have the accumulated issues, okay, over the bonanzas divided by exports at the peak, okay, and here you have all the accumulated issues during the bus, okay, and uh, then you have now, okay, the second episode of financial globalization and blue here the episode of financial globalization and they are identified by the of the and you can look at the top at whether answers during bonanzas back then and now are similar or whether issues during bus in the first episode vis-a-vis -vis the second episode are the same. And what you find is that issues during bonanzas in the earlier period was far larger okay, than uh, issues in the second period. So the, mid, the average issuance uh, was about almost 200% of total exports. Okay, whereas now it's a little bit more than 100% of total exports. And they are statistically different. The bus, what you observe is that the bus during the first episode of financial globalization, total issuance was much smaller than total issuance during the bus in the second episode of financial globalization. So there is a, for the general analysis of capital flow bonanzas and bus before and, and, uh, and now, what you find is that bonanzas are smaller and issuance during the bus is larger. So you have a less, the amplitude of the cycle is much smaller. I would like to examine a little bit what triggers this. Okay, so I'm going now to separate, okay, the capital flows uh, during around crisis in the financial center and capital flows 
uh, idiosyncratic capital flows. And the largest crisis during this, um, the first episode of financial globalization were London in 1825, the crisis in Germany, uh, starting in Germany and Austria in 1873, the Paris crisis in 1890, and of course the London and New York crisis uh, in 1929. For the second episode of financial globalization, you have the US commercial bank crisis following the international lending boom in developing countries and all the borrowing, yes, from, um, from uh, OPEC countries and then the subprime crisis. These are the crises, and I don't have time to go over. When you identify this crisis, okay, you can see the World Financial Fragility Index starts increasing. Okay, those are the most severe crises, both during the second episode of financial globalization and the first, ep and the first <coughs> episode of financial globalization. <coughs> the measure of world financial fragility looks at the number of uh, banking, currency, and sovereign debt crises in a group of 70 countries, and the data is from Carmen Reichert. Okay, um, so I did, uh, when I classify the uh, capital flow cycles between systemic and idiosyncratic, this is the number that I obtain. And here you have a little bit an idea of how different systemic and uh, idiosyncratic crises are. Um, so you can look at the graphs, but you can also look at the, um, well, let me see, I don't want, let me move to the other one. I don't have time to go over all of them. Um, so here I'm looking at capital flow bonanzas in the earlier period and in the uh, second period. And what you find is that it is at the core of these differences in the amplitude of capital flow bonanzas uh, in the first episode and in the second episode is that it is a systemic crisis, okay? Whereas uh, idiosyncratic crisis, uh, the bonanzas of idiosyncratic crisis um, back then and right now is very similar. Oh. Here you have issues during the busts. And look that in the uh, earlier period, okay, uh, issues during systemic crisis during the bust was almost half of what uh, it was, the issuance of uh, cycles that were not around a crisis in the financial center. What we observe right now is that the opposite is happening. The issuance during, uh, in the past during systemic in the aftermath of systemic crisis is far larger than issuance during the past when you are looking at other type of crisis, at other type of cycles. Okay. So, I'm not going to have a lot of time to go over it, uh, but the questions that I ask is what is triggering these differences? And as usual in all international finance literature, you have to look at pull factors and push factors. And I'm going to be looking, uh, we don't have pull factors, remember this is the 19th century, the data that I'm going to be looking at is growth rate of exports, uh, for uh, all the countries in the periphery. I'm going, I constructed data on terms of trade of Latin American countries. And for the full push factors, I'm going to be looking at interest rates and I'm going to capture uh, economic activity in the rest of the world by looking at imports in the financial centers. Okay? So let me just, um, I'm going to do first of all some event studies. Okay? Um, and let me show you, okay, I'm not going to focus on other pull factors uh, because pull factors look different across systemic and idiosyncratic episodes, okay, both during idiosyncratic cycles and during uh, systemic cycles. They look similarly across the two different episodes of financial globalization. So this cannot explain. Okay, why the systemic bonanzas and the systemic bus in the second episode are, uh, are different, okay? So, but you, have, you see here, this is the, um, the capital flow cycles, um, the systemic ones, and these are idiosyncratic ones. 
um, during the second episode of financial globalization, you have capital flow cycles, okay, around the peak and around the peak here, and you can see that systemic cycles are even a little bit, yeah, is, is smaller, okay. So, what happens with the interest rates? I'm not going to, I don't have time to look at uh, other uh, variables. Um, when you look at idiosync, um, everything is centered around the peak of uh, the cycles in the periphery. And you can take a look a little bit at interest rates <coughs> during around the peak of idiosyncratic cycles and during the peak in systemic cycles. And you can see there, this is the gold standard, monetary policy didn't change much. But when you look at the second episode of financial globalization, there is a big difference in monetary policy uh, during panics in the financial center and monetary policy in the United States around idiosyncratic uh, capital flow bonanzas. Okay? Here you can have okay, an idea of how monetary policy changed back then and right now around crisis times and around uh, overall the sample. And you can see that you cannot reject the hypothesis that monetary policy in the financial center was different during the uh, crisis times. Whereas here, okay, you can see how much drastic monetary policy was around uh, crisis times compared to normal times. So just to give you a sense of what else I have done, okay? I look at local projections and I separate the local projections for systemic, systemic cycles and idiosyncratic cycles. And I look at the role of monetary policy, okay, in, those, in these two um, uh, episodes and in systemic and idiosyncratic cycles. And this is what you obtain. Um, here I'm looking at one standard deviation shock in interest rate during the first episode of financial globalization during idiosyncratic cycles in the periphery and during systemic cycles in the periphery. And um, so I'm looking at tightening during booms and at easing during booms. And I'm looking at different horizons, what is the effect of monetary policy of a shock to monetary policy on uh, the uh, capital flows. And what you find is that there are not differences across okay, um, cycles around the panic and cycles that were not okay, around the panic in the financial center. But when you look at um, the second episode of financial globalization, things change. So now you can find that a one standard deviation shock to, monet to interest rates in the financial center have an effect they are um, reducing the size of the bonanza. Uh, whereas the idiosyncratic ones, so here you have the 95% uh, percent confidence bonds, uh, whereas um, the idiosyncratic, um, during idiosyncratic cycles, I didn't put the bonds because it become uh, very confused, uh, they are not statistically different from zero. Similarly, during the uh, bust, uh, easing during the bust, uh, during systemic uh, cycles, created okay, much larger bonanzas. Whereas during idiosyncratic cycles, you don't see any effects of monetary policy on capital flows. Okay, so uh, I also did some panel estimations. I don't have time uh, to go over it. Uh, so let me just have some of the uh, reflections on these results. Uh, so, uh, bombs and bus cycles uh, uh, are hardy perennials, okay? Still, uh, bonanzas and bus are much less pronounced right now than they were uh, in the past. And this is different from all the analysis. Once you, all the analysis about the role of the um, of financial, of monetary policy in the United States says that 
uh, this triggers much more volatile uh, capital flow cycles. But when you compare two episodes in which you have the gold standard, you find an opposite result. Not for all of them, but just for the uh, cycles around the panic in the financial center. Um, so, uh, the only thing I guess that I have to finish, uh, and if you are interested, you can download my paper. Um, so what I find is that even though during the first episode of financial globalization, there was no monetary policy okay, to talk about, uh, during the second episode of financial globalization, monetary policy was counter-cyclical and very aggressive around panics in the financial center. What we find uh, is still that at the end of panics in the financial center, whether there is monetary policy in the financial center or there is no monetary policy in the financial center, the collapse in economic activity is very similar. So uh, we didn't have liquidity back then. Now perhaps we have too much liquidity and too much debt. Uh, so this is something to answer afterwards. So I think that I finish on time. <laughs> Oh, I have a question. Okay. Oh, I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, you can. You, um, you say so many good things I about me. I see that you have the world uh, upside down like Marty would have liked you to show it. Thank you. For uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Marty would have put the upside down. The upside down. Yeah, no, but she, she hated to be in the, because they always put Australia in the bottle, if she didn't like that. Anyway, a couple of questions. When you, um, very interesting, but uh, first of all, very interesting work. Um, when you were putting the data together for a particular day, early part, the 1800s, mm -hmm. uh, you have a chart there somewhere where you have, uh, um, uh, if you go back, it's uh, Argentina had some 800 and something, and Mexico had 300 and something of bond insurance. Uh -huh. um, um, and I, this brings a question, when you collected the data, was it, you created that by whatever you found? I mean, basically, you found the data and you constructed it? Because it surprises me a lot. Uh -huh. And I'll tell you, I think you have to be very careful what happened in the 1800s. <laughs> Um, because, um, well, at first I don't know the data, I mean, it was a question of the data, but the second one is, starting in 1820, uh, uh, more or less, you have several wars of independence going on. Mm -hmm. All over Latin America, starting with Mexico in 1820. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what's happening at the time is that the, the governments are changing. There's a lot of uh, instability, so the, 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 the government debt and the private debt Kind of a different, difficult to separate because you know there is coup d'etats and all kinds of things. So you know what it was the government debt of the previous government. Now it isn't. I mean, Mexico was invaded by France mm -hmm. because of not paying the debt mm -hmm. um, in the 1800s. Uh, so uh, item number one. Number two is that so there's a lot of political issues going on uh, that I think you make it. Uh, you know, I mean, some of these countries were borrowing not because they were in bonanza, but because they were in crisis. And, and maybe the money, it was a savings glut, there was sort of thing, there was no place to put the money. Mm -hmm. So that's the question number one about that. And the second one is about monetary policy. Um, I don't know how to interpret monetary policy in the 1800s and early 1900s. Mm -hmm. I think you kind of uh, talk a little bit about it. There was no U.S. as we know it. 1847, the United States was half the size of what it is today. It was a Mexico monetary policy. Mexico in 1910 had a, a revolution, which up until then, the money that it was circulating in Europe was uh, coined in Mexico because of the silver. Mm -hmm. And so it was a major liquidity shock to the world, really, and, and to uh, China because of the trade, uh, when there was no more uh, co uh, silver coins circulating in, in, in Europe from Mexico. So the shock was really the opposite, in a way. It was, it was uh, what you call peri periphery that had a, a liquidity impact in the world. Uh, so it just kind of uh, is very you know, appealing to think what happened then, but it was so, uh, you know, so, so much caveat of history that you have to be very careful of that. No, I am scrapping just, this is the beginning. There are lots of things, and I agree with you, that 
can move these cycles. Okay? First of all, after the first uh, period in which all the countries in Latin America borrowed, they all went in default. Most of them were uh, with wars, okay? So it was not just Mexico, Argentina was yeah, in yeah. war, Brazil yeah, was in war. So um, there are other things to import. Second of all, they have different exchange regimes at different moments of time that I'm not looking, I'm collecting data from the black markets that you have, you cannot look at London, you have to look at the at Buenos Aires, at Montevideo, things like that. So there are lots of things, okay, that might have affected these capital flows. For the time being, the only thing that I'm uh, collecting data is an economic activity that presumably is capturing a lot of the war effects too. So uh, I'm looking also at terms of trade. So this is the only data that I've been collecting. Um, and yes, there are different issues that you have to, to consider, but this is the first pass of the data, and I, I, did, I never thought that I was going to find such a strong results. But Argentina had three times more than Mexico, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, listen, uh, Mexico was in default for 60 years. It borrowed both Colombia and Mexico, were some of the richest countries in the 1820s. Mexico because it was producing silver, uh, Colombia because it was producing gold. They borrow uh, a lot. You can see, uh, I have a paper on uh, sovereign defaults at that time. They borrow 600% of total exports, whereas other countries borrow less in that period. So during uh, 80 years, they starting restructurings, they couldn't borrow, so that's why at the beginning it was a lot of issues for Mexico, but towards the end, uh, only in the 1880s, started to, Mexico started to restart uh, borrowing. Um, so that's why it's less. Argentina was by far the largest borrower uh, in international capital markets, and it was the one when you look at growth rates, it was the one that was growing the most. Uh, so, uh, so this, there is some an explanation, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Professor Garcia Lepex. Professor is in charge. I just have a question in terms of your classification of idiosyncratic and systemic. Uh -huh. um, if my memory serves me right, when, when I think of the Bearings collapse in 1890, right? Mm -hmm. It was of excessive exposure by UK firms to Argentina and Argentine railroads. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was really a turn in Argentina mm -hmm. that precipitated what could have been a systemic crisis in London, yeah. right? And then there was a private sector bailout and so on and so forth. So how do you classify Bearings, I mean, how do you classify the 1990 crisis? Is that, was that idiosyncratic? I, no, the, the, the crisis I find, I try to classify the, the, the size of the panic and the effects of the panic in the financial center. And what I did, ah, let me say, there are lots of crises in the financial centers back then, and there are also more crises in the US, okay? Right uh, during the second episode of financial globalization. So if you look at the uh, crisis in 1988 in the United States, it was not a crisis. It was a crisis, but it was borderline. And it ended up being known as savings and loan crisis, whereas the 2008 crisis was the global crisis, you know? Uh, so you need to classify in some way and eliminate all the little panics in the financial center. Okay, and that's what I did. Uh, when I'm doing this, I'm looking at what are the effects, okay, of crisis in the financial center on world fragility, okay? So, for example, there are other crises. So here I have the crisis that I selected, okay? But there was a crisis in London in 1836-38. There was a crisis in London in 1847. There was another crisis in 1857. And so I choose the crises that are the most dangerous ones, okay, that they more create fragility, but looking at what happens after this crisis. And this is the 
number of crises, the index of financial fragility that looks at crisis, currency crisis, banking crisis, and sovereign debt crisis in 70 countries. Okay, and this is not a data that I created, it's a data that you can download from Carmen Reinhardt's uh, website. And you, what you can see is that the crisis that I identify, okay, the index of fragility increases right after the crisis. This is the 1825, this is the 1873, this is the Barings crisis, okay? This is the crisis in eight, uh, 1929, starting in uh, London and, uh, and New York, okay? This is the crisis, the, 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 the problem in the commercial banking sector in the United States that the Fed took very careful care through a lot of negotiations so that these, uh, these banks were not going to default, but they trigger a lot of fragility around the world, okay? And then this is the global crisis that you have most of the crises were banking crises at that time, and uh, they were not lasting, but the increase, you know, from 0.2 to 0.6, so uh, it's an important crisis. So that's how I decided to, okay, characterize which are the largest crises, those rare disasters, those black swans that uh, Brenda was talking about. Uh, there are many other crises, especially during the uh, 19th century. There's an 1866 crisis in London, 1882 in Paris. So you have to choose, okay? And I chose by looking at what were the effects, okay, of this crisis in, uh, in the financial center. And presumably these crises are different, so I'm interested in comparing to with a global crisis, and so I'm using only, I classify as systemic cycles at, as those cycles that are around these panics. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to cut off this conversation, it's <laughs> fascinating. Um, <laughs> but you're not getting rid of me because you assigned me another role. <laughs> I'm gonna assign you another role, um, and then, so I'm gonna turn that role over to you, and then we have some closing remarks and then we have a reception waiting for us, so that's why I have to keep us on time. <laughs> um, um, Warwick was going to uh, give all the acknowledgements, but unfortunately he's sick and I think that he's seen us. <laughs> so get well soon, <laughs> Warwick. <laughs> so uh, I have to do his job, okay? I think that the conference has been a great success. Um, it's not just that we learn a lot, because I learn a lot, but it's also, it's about Marty and how she left uh, uh, something on us. And I think that we are all much warmer now from the inside after this uh, conference. We, we, because we learn about all our experiences with uh, with Marty and uh, they are exactly the same, they're very similar. We can, Talk about different stories, but the end of all those stories is have, she was a very good friend, and we really uh, grew up with her uh, in uh, in our quality of life. So, um, so I don't know. Um, um, I would like to talk about everybody that did contribute. Okay, I want to thank especially to Renee. Uh, uh, she was the heart of all this organization. Without her, okay, we're doing it at GW. We are not doing it in Canberra. 